Hello, everyone. Welcome to our weekly discussion series that's hosted by the Chaldean Cultural Center in collaboration with U of M Detroit Center, Unique Voices in Films, and CMN TV. I'm your host, We Am Nemo. And today, our guest is Noor Al Abedi. Hello, Noor. Hi, everyone. So, Noor is a Juris Doctor and Master's in International Affairs dual degree student at the University of Ottawa Faculty of Law and the Norman Patterson School of International Affairs. Born in Canada, Noor's parents are from the marshes of southern Iraq. She hopes to someday visit her ancestral waters and learn firsthand about life in the marshes. So Noor, I am so excited to have you because I, I'm excited to be um, interviewing a first-hand <laughs> someone from the Marsh people, because we talk about this community in our museum. Um, and it feels like, and it's it's a it's an indigenous group um, that I feel like, and I, I think you might agree with that, is probably underrepresented in that community, but it has an incredibly fascinating history, which you're gonna tell us about today. But before we go um, into information about the community, um, so tell us about your childhood in Canada, having um, been born there and growing up in Canada as someone of Iraqi background. Yeah, so first, thank you so much well, for having me tonight. And uh, growing up in, in Canada was interesting as an Iraqi. I grew up in a small city in Southwestern Ontario, and honestly, it was something it's not a topic I normally discuss, but in this context, I would say that it was bittersweet in the sense that, of course, it was not easy being visibly Muslim, as you can see, in a city that was and still is predominantly white. So I grew up in London, Ontario, and there still is a lot of violent hatred towards Muslims and people of color. And just last summer, perhaps you heard about it in London, Ontario, there was a Muslim family murdered by a white supremacist when they were walking in the streets. And so... It definitely was not easy growing up in a place like that, both as an Iraqi you know, a woman of color, but also as a visible Muslim. And another thing I found that was interesting, specifically as an Iraqi, is that there's a threat here of kidnapping that I think a lot of newcomers don't expect because back home, you know, it's like the village raises our children. And if your kid goes out, you expect them to come home. You don't just assume that strangers are a threat to your children. And it, I think it was very jarring for a lot of newcomers, Iraqis and um, other newcomers. You have to actually be scared of, of kidnappings. And so from my own experience, this was something that we were always worried about. So there's like the uh, cultural cultural shock aspect. I just I'm sure, but it was a culture shock. Um, I remember my mom telling me that something should be like early covers. So, Noor, you're, you you're freezing just a little bit. And I was wondering if maybe um, and the camera was, everything was okay a few minutes ago, but I don't know why you're freezing right now. Do you want to read? Would you like to read? Would you like to re sign in? Because I can't, I can't hear your. Uh, I can hear So our interview with Noor will continue in just a few seconds. She's just signing in again. We just had some um, difficulties with the internet. So we're just gonna hold off. But um, as I was saying earlier, that in the museum, we talk about um, the Marsh people who have their history back to thousands of years ago. And this is why really we were really interested in um, interviewing Noor and learning more about that community. She's going to sign right back on. Hi, Noor. Hi, am I back? 
Yes, we just had a few uh, minutes of technical difficulties, but please continue sharing your story about, um, you were saying, you know, the cultural shock that occurs with Iraqis. Um, so those that's the case when the, with the Iraqis that are coming to Canada, and I'm sure even in Iraq, I worked for um, refugee agencies where I saw Iraqis, you know, even though they've encountered war, but they'll come here and they'll experience this culture shock and they want to go back despite the situation. And these are minority groups who have suffered quite a bit. Um, but how how was it for you? Is it, do you feel that even though you were born there because of what you see your communities going through, so how, that is how it affects you? Yeah, I think it, it's yeah. difficult to watch what's, what the Marsh Iraqis back home are going through. No, actually, there are protests happening right now where a lot of young men are being arrested or, or brutalized by police officers in protesting the government's inaction or, or poor actions towards the marshes. So it is it is difficult to watch that happen. And of course, it was a, also a culture shock for me, even though I was born there, because I'm being raised by individuals who expected a certain culture that we expected it to be like back home where your children are safe in the streets but that wasn't the case and so i think that absolutely had an impact on me as well and how i assume society worked so um so we talked a little bit about your experience in canada but tell us about the marsh people um you know your ancestral waters as you call them of southern iraq uh, tell us about the history and just on a personal level, as well as ju the general history of that region. Yeah, thank you for asking. So the history of the Mesopotamian marshes is, as the title suggests, one that predates the modern state system we know today. The history I think I could talk about for hours and I still would only really scratch the surface. But it is a very important history, as you mentioned. And it's one of the reasons I'm glad it was recognized in 2016, rightfully, as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And so that, I think, was very long overdue. And I understand the UNESCO was, and perhaps still is, under a lot of heat for the underrepresentation of sites in the Global South, both environmental and cultural heritage sites. I'm sure you're well aware of that. Um, but it's an incredibly important example of, of Iraqi history and Iraqi heritage and, and world heritage. So yeah, I think it's important to get a general understanding of marshes. And the Iraqi marshes are a series of wetlands existing primarily at the floodplains of the Tigris and Euphrates, and they stretch across southern Iraq through Nasriya, Basra, and into southwestern Iran. And so, as you know, in the early 1990s, the marshes were drained by Saddam, and many already know this, but for those who don't, it was done in an effort both to punish the marsh Arabs for rising against him and also to altogether destroy the marshes and the people because it was an area that offers, or it is still an area that offers effective refuge for those who would seek it. And so that was a genocide that happened quite recently, some 30 years ago. So that's what I would say about, about the history. And personally, that comes back to my family, obviously, because they escaped that. And of course, they survived and came to Canada. Uh, but you were telling me earlier that you still have some family in that area. How is their lifestyle today? And how would you say it differs from previously? So first, they don't they don't live in the central marshes as they did before, because the way of life is in, incredibly difficult. Once you're out, it's, it's incredibly difficult to go back in, which is one reason I think um, the genocide was so horrible is that you force people out and um, it's difficult for them to go back. And so... The family that I do have there is, is not in the marshes, but they do visit occasionally. My mother was there recently and she sent some really beautiful photos when she was there. And yeah, I was, it was beautiful to see her back in the marshes. So it's still an active community. Yes. What, what challenges is it facing today? So I know in the past you said that it was facing, there was a genocide uh, during Saddam's time. What are the difficulties that it's experiencing right now? Yeah, so that's a that's a good question. And so I think the difficulties right now is not it's not just the genocide that the Marsh Arabs went through, it's also 
um, new and different threats to their way of life and to the marshes itself. So I think another threat to the marsh Arabs as a collective that's not often discussed outside of the context of genocide is the racism towards the marsh Arabs. I heard from marsh Arab youth around the world that they had no idea they were even from the marshes because their family or their parents decided to kind of forego that identity and leave it behind once they'd left. And they didn't see a need to. It just kind of brought difficulty or, or stigma or racism. And so I've heard from those youth that they'll show their parents my tweets or they'll show their family, and it'll give them a sense of pride to start reclaiming that identity. Another obvious issue, of course, is the, the threat of climate change. So drought and um, unexpected weather and the draining of the marshes itself obviously created a lot of salinity in the water that destroyed the biodiversity. But then we also have damming projects in Turkey and Iran that are lowering the level of water and obviously that leads to higher salinity levels. And so it's, it's of course, not just the genocide, it's also poor management, it's um, damming projects, it's the racism that Marsh Arabs face. There's a lot that these, that this indigenous community is up against. So when you say racism, are you talking about racism with within Iraq, or are you say, talking about the racism that they experience when they um, immigrate abroad? That's a great question. I'm actually referring specifically to anti-Marsh Arabs, like specifically in Iraq, the derogatory terms and the stigmas against Marsh Arabs. Is it Arabs. because of the location? I mean, is it because they're from the South? Is that, um, and, and how are they distinguished from other Iraqis? Is it through their accent or, what distinguishes them? People just automatically kind of know, you know, when you live in a certain area, in most countries anyways, you can tell by the person's accent or by their name. So how are they distinguished versus other communities? Yeah, that's a great question. It's really important. So part of it is is the accent. I know um, I've heard stories of, of women from the marshes marrying into families outside of the marshes and having their accent, you know, ruthlessly criticized or they're seen as lesser than because that accent indicates that they're from the marshes. And it's not its not just an accent, of course, there's also words from the Sumerian language itself that, that's been carried down into the language that the marsh Arabs now speak, the dialect of Arabic that they speak. Um, but it's also the individuals themselves, like if they self-identify once they live outside the marshes, or if others identify them for whatever reason, there are words that people refer to the marsh Arabs as. I won't say the words, but they're derogatory and they're widespread and and individuals use them as slurs against Marsh Arabs. So those words usually mean, or they refer to the Marsh Arabs as being you know, uneducated or backwards or barbaric. But uh, so you mentioned about uh, the Marsh people using Sumerian, some Sumerian words. So are they descendants from the Sumerians? Yeah, so they are considered descendants from the Sumerians both in the sense that they're an indigenous group where the Sumerians had previously lived, and also interestingly because their way of life reflects the way of life that the Sumerians lived. So the boats that they use and the, the houses that they live in and the way that they build those homes and the way that they build those, those uh, boats and using water buffaloes and living off of the water. So for example, I've seen tablets that depict images of, of those homes and those boats and the water buffaloes to prove that that way of life has survived some 5,000 years from the Sumerians all the way down to the Marsh Arabs. And a um, really interesting way of life because people live on the water itself, so their homes float on the marshes and they're completely dependent on the marshes, which is why, of course, the genocide that targets the marshes themselves can be so effective because that identity is tied to the ecosystem itself. So without a marshland, you don't have Marsh Arabs. And yet, for these thousands of years, despite everything in the droughts and all that, they have survived. What, what do you yeah. think, um, you know, what, what do they credit that to, this kind of survival, given that, uh, that they are basically living off the land? Yeah, I mean, is and, there, um, what do you think is the thing? What's the richness? Because, um, you know, in one of the questions, we were wanting to know, like, what's the misconception but I, about them or... Um, but I think maybe what is their strength that keeps them 
continuing. And I had shared with you before the interview that after the war, there was a program, an Iraqi program, um, where a broadcaster went into the marshes and interviewed these people. I was so fascinated by it. I was fascinated by their lifestyle. And I actually um, honored the, the way they were living. I thought it was um, was close to the indigenous uh, people of um, the United States. The Native Americans is the way that they lived. There was that ancient indigenous feeling and strength that you can sense being indigenous ourselves or being, you know, living amongst the Native Americans. So for me, I saw that that was, you know, part of their strengths. But what do you attribute there's the strength of such a community that has gone through so much and yet persevered and yet continues to live fairly similar lifestyle as thousands of years ago. Yeah, this question actually excites me a lot as an Iraqi Canadian because I do also care a lot about Indigenous people here in Canada and I was talking to an Indigenous woman the other day and we were discussing kind of that global solidarity between Indigenous people and how much similarity there was between our our ways of life. Um, but I would say that the marshes, living there is, from what I've heard, it's not easy. It's not an easy way of life, even without the genocide, even without the racism, even if you separate all of that, the life itself is not easy. So we're talking about a group of individuals that are incredibly resilient, honorable, dignified, they have a, a very rich culture to them. And what I would say is, it makes it even more sad that they were denied that pride in their identity so recently, because that history is thousands of years old. And so I think it's, I think what I'd like to convey most is that the, the Marsh way of life, it's not one that's easy, but still that doesn't justify the racism that they go through. And what's especially frustrating is that a lot of these individuals that belittle Marsh Arabs and refer to us in derogatory terms are the ones who were the first to raise their noses about the Sumerian history that Iraq has. And so those same individuals are the ones who come to the marshes to enjoy it as an aesthetic while they're still seeing the individuals that live there as uncivilized and barbaric. And this idea that marsh Arabs are uneducated or backwards, it's incredibly harmful and it's elitist. And what I'd like everyone to know is that should a person be uneducated, doesn't matter. Even if their way of life is harsh or difficult, that takes nothing away from their dignity or their value as, as people and, and their history. So Mark, um, Arabs, they were some of us, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, I was just gonna say Marsh Arabs are some of the most honorable and generous individuals I've ever come across. So there's a great deal to be proud of in that resilience, that existence, that survival. Well, I'm sure like if they, if anybody were, were to throw myself and you and into that community us educated women we would barely survive <laughs> so i think <laughs> it says a lot about how we don't know how they do it yes there's the resilience and all we, we understand that there's something very very deep and very ancient that they have that we need to learn from and so given our understanding and our appreciation of that community, what is being done to preserve that community? If anything, is there um, a lack of, I, I mean, I'm sure there is a lack, but it, what is being done and what more needs to be done for that community? Yeah, and thanks for saying that. I, that actually reminded me as well that there, this idea that we have of education is obviously a very westernized perspective at this point, but they have a great deal of indigenous knowledge that is priceless. So when we and individuals claim that they're uneducated, what they're doing is is taking a, a certain idea of education and placing it on individuals that have a different way of education. But to answer your question about preserving the way of life, I think there are a lot of efforts by some really incredible individuals. But more recently, I think last year, it started a group of really brilliant um, academics in Iraq started documenting the, um, the language itself, the dialect, and they're kind of putting together a dictionary of Marsh era words that come from the Sumerian language. So that's being done. And then today, actually this week, there's there have been protests and uh, the youth are, are facing a lot of backlash for that, but they're protesting in support of the marshes. And it does give me a lot of hope, not in the sense that I think the government will respond well, because we've seen that they're not responding well to the protests, but in the sense that the 
the attitude is shifting. I think that individuals are starting to see the value in preserving the marshes where perhaps there wasn't that much care before. And also I would hope that that would translate shifting the attitude towards monkey Arabs as well, not just the marshes itself. Because you remember back in 2016 when it became a heritage site, a lot of people were very proud of it, but that didn't translate much into respect for the marsh Arabs themselves. It just became kind of like, we need to go there, we need to take photos there. It became a tourist attraction, which is amazing. It's incredible. I'm, I'm glad it is. But it also needs to translate into respect towards the people that are from those marshes as well. So, Nora, what can, um, can Iraqi communities in the diaspora do to help um, elevate awareness about this community and what is something that they can just do to help in any kind of way? Uh, and also, where are the the people that have left Iraq? Where have they normally gone? Which are the places? Is Canada the has the most population or have they traveled elsewhere? I think that's a good question. I'll start with that question. I think it's a good question only because there are a lot of challenges to figuring out where Marsh Arabs have gone just because, like I mentioned earlier, a lot of them kind of leave that identity behind because of the amount of racism they faced. So it's difficult to know, but I've come across Marsh Arabs across Ontario, in Canada, in America, across Europe. But I don't know if there's a specific pocket of Marsh Arabs anywhere in the world because it's, it's difficult. And I think that would be a nice place to start for those that are outside of the marshes to figure out where we are to kind of create that network. And to answer your question on how individuals can help and support I thought I'm assuming I'm talking to an audience that's outside of Iraq, and so an excellent place to start would be to follow the Marsh Arab youth, both in the marshes and, of course, outside, but um, specifically the Marshes Collective. Um, on Twitter and Instagram, they, they have a great the social media platform. So it's, it's getting a little bit yeah. hard to understand you right marshes now. Marshes Collective. Marshes Collective, for people to follow the Marshes Collective on Twitter. Yeah, and Instagram. And Instagram, okay. And then the other one was Marsh, the Marshes, the youth, or something like that you said? Um, another one would be Ahwari Voices. What was the first word? Ahwari, so it's spelled A-H-W-A-R-I. Okay. So by following so yeah, that so we can see cool. what's the status and the situation for the marsh people. And like I said, I think um, for people when they when they visit, so regardless of their background, whether you're of Iraqi background or not, it's really an amazing community that people can learn from. Um, if that community was here today in the United States, they would be really um, afforded the, the things that they need because the, I think the richness and the fact that they've been able to survive as long as they have uh, would would be honored in some way. Uh, and, and change of perspective is a very good place to start for beginners. And then after that, learning about this community, their hardships, what they've gone through, and really understanding that that's there's something um, and that community to learn from at the end of the day. That's really important. It's not just an observation. Like you said, the tourists and all that, it's, that is great. But at the same time, I know when I was watching those Iraqi shows of, of the broadcaster, which unfortunately I haven't been able to find them since then, it's been a while back, I learned a great deal. I saw how, I saw how they created something out of nothing. You know, the, the, the way they work, the way they operated their communities, there was a, a very, very structured system there. So you get to understand more. It's not what it looks from the outside, just that people are living it what seems like backward, but it's not. It's a very well-established community. And uh, I'd like to learn more about your, um, you, so you're studying law. Tell us more about what kind of law you're practicing and what do you see yourself doing in the future and um, and specifically with regards to your the community um, do, do you see yourself working with the community back home in any kind of way absolutely yeah so my interest in law really comes from a pursuit of justice 
and a sense of obligation to humanity. And so there's a great deal of work to be done, whether it's Marsh Arabs, the suffering they've gone through, or other oppressed groups across the world. And so a law degree was just one way that I, I hope to equip myself to aid in that work. And I'm interested generally in human rights law. And I still have to figure out what that looks like in practice, whether it's international human rights or labor, employment, and human rights more domestically here in Canada. It's still something that I'm figuring out. But no matter where I go or what I do, I am still absolutely looking for ways to support Marsh Arabs and the marshes itself. And I think we're under threat of climate change, and that's going to be increasingly important over the years. And with it, I hope people will also understand that the marshes is, is, is somewhere to learn from that this was a sustainable, a perfectly sustainable way of life where climate change would never be a thing if we were listening to indigenous voices that know how to live off of the land or the water without destroying it. And it's unfortunate because we're talking about a perfectly sustainable way of life that will suffer disproportionately from climate change where they've contributed nothing to it, to creating the crisis itself. So Noor, are there organizations or, uh, of any sort outside of Iraq that are helping um, the Marsh people or are there people that want to start certain organizations? Because I'm wondering, you know, where is, is there a one, um, a place, a, a foundation that could people connect to, to, to help out? I wish I knew. I'm sure there is. And I would assume that it would be somewhere in the UK, like perhaps not a network or something. Perhaps um, you can start one. <laughs> I'll start one here in Canada. Yeah, um, why not? <laughs> Absolutely. You know what? I, I mean, you don't even need a location, but I think that speaking the way you are right now, there needs to be some kind of a base where people, and, and I understand, the, the reason I say that is because when I was asking you about where the population is and given your answer, so um, the Chaldean population, when I realized shortly after I became the executive director at the Chaldean Cultural Center, we were trying to see where the community lives, the uh, um, the census in different countries. What we found is Michigan, um, we found the majority is, is just really the church was where you got all this information, and that Michigan is the only one in the world that we found that has organizations for the Chaldeans, which I was very surprised because there is a large community in different places of the world. Um, and then I realized how important that was. And, you know, our people here, we started it with meeting at homes. That's how it starts in a restaurant. You know, you form a name, you meet a restaurant, and it grows to the point where, but what it helps, um, that it made me really appreciate our um, uh, founding, you know, pioneers who helped build the museum, who helped build these different organizations. But it, it sounds like your you, your community would would benefit a great deal by starting something where they can feel there's a place to reach out to. And uh, given the, the degree that you're going to be involved with and stuff and that you're already representing them, I it, it would be just so easy to just establish something. It just sounds like one of the needs. And um, we're very happy to highlight their works in, in the near future in various ways, as I had mentioned. But I give you so much credit for putting yourself and taking down that role because I know it's it's really not an easy role. It's not an easy role to speak for a community and describe it and, and all all the things that you're doing. But I'm sure we're gonna be seeing a lot of you more in the in the near future, don't you think? I hope so. I think they have a great person representing them so uh, <laughs> they're very happy to have you they have a very great person representing them i'm so happy something like that is happening because when we share that in the museum we are very excited to learn more and i have to tell you that the people that we give tours to when we talk about the marsh people they're very engaged they're very interesting and so if ever there is something going on or if um if, if something is formed, we would pass this information on just so that you know or, and whoever is out there. So, but we have very uh, little time left. So any last words? Well, I actually just wanted to thank you. This was incredibly inspiring hearing about your work that you've done. And so thank you so much for featuring the Marsh identity on, on your segment on minorities in Iraq. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. For doing that it means a lot to us as a community that's underrepresented well you're very welcome but we're not done right <laughs>
<laughs> we have a lot more to do. So this no, is just the beginning. Yeah, yeah. This this is we're just warming up. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, Noel, for joining us and for giving us this valuable, very rich history. Uh, I just I advise people just to go online and research the March people. There's so much to learn. There's so to learn. They're so fascinating and they're very lovable too, by the way. That's another thing that all the stuff that you're telling me. So what I noticed about them, and again, this happens also with indigenous people a lot, is that despite all their hardships during their interviews and they were getting, uh, you see the most like the, the strength and the humor and the positivity inside of them. So just right there, that's a lesson to learn about life. So thank you everybody for watching and have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye-bye.